So hello everyone, um, I'm Dr. Amanda Shear. I'm an assistant professor and extension plant pathologist with Auburn University and Alabama Cooperative Extension. Uh, first, I would just like to thank you all for coming and joining us virtually this year for the peanut production meetings. I'm sorry we couldn't meet in person, but at least we're able to get the information out to you virtually. Uh, today I'm just gonna be talking about some basic peanut disease and nematode management options for 2021. So uh, first I just kind of wanted to give a quick update on what we saw this past season uh, for 2020 uh, in terms of peanut disease issues. We had all the usual suspects, but overall uh, tomato spotted wilt virus incidence was a lot lower this year. Um, it was at about four and a half percent in terms of incidence throughout the southeast. Uh, in 2019 it was at about seven percent. Um, so at least that was good news this year. Uh, we did see the highest pressure probably in the southwest part of the state in our peanut trials in Bruton, especially for Georgia 16HO and Georgia 06G. Uh, we did see some thrips damage um, at some of our trials in Headland, but it didn't really translate into tomato spotted wilt virus. Um, in terms of leaf spot, uh, pressure was pretty similar this year as it was for 2019. Um, early leaf spot kind of started around early August and then progressed throughout September. Uh, late leaf spot started about mid-September and progressed rapidly through September and October. Uh, white mold was high in some locations, but overall was pretty mild. Uh, disease incidence in some of our fungicide trials was pretty low and disappointing for us. Uh, we did see some rust this year due to the tropical storms and Hurricane Sally, especially in Fairhope and Headland. Um, and we also got a couple of reports of cylindricanium black rot um, in Baldwin and Geneva counties. So now that I kind of just gave a quick overview, um, I'll just talk about some general peanut disease management basics and in terms of nematodes. We're not really reinventing the wheel this year for 2021, but I'll just kind of go over some of the information that we also touched on last year. So of course, crop rotation is extremely important, especially for nematodes, uh, seedling and seed borne diseases, um, and as well as foliar diseases. You really want to rotate out of peanuts for at least two years. Um, that can really help with reducing nematode pressure. And as well as uh, white mold and also your leaf spot diseases as only uh, the leaf spot pathogens only go to peanuts. Um, seed quality issues was also kind of a, an issue this year as well. Not quite as big as it was in 2019, but of course we always have our seed borne diseases and you can really manage those with good seed quality and seeding rates. Uh, and the reason why I wanted to bring up, uh, you know, seed quality is in previous years we have had issues with Aspergillus black or crown rot. We get these um, kind of seed rots or pre-emergent stamping off or sudden wilting of young plants. Um, disease outbreaks are really related to poor seed quality, especially if you save seed from year to year. Um, also extreme heat or changes in the soil moisture, especially at the seedling stage, can increase your risk. For aspergillus black, aspergillus black and crown rot. Uh, seedling damage from pesticides and cultivations or insects can also increase your risk. In terms of management, you want to get really good quality seed, especially with high germination rates and vigor, um, and also get some that are treated with fungicides. Um, also some inferro fungicide applications of your xoxystrobins can help. Uh, just to present some research that kind of backs up what I'm saying, um, this is one of our field trials from about 2018 where we looked at a stressed peanut seed and we looked at comparing seed versus in furrow treatments to help manage a lot of these seedling and seed rot diseases. So at the, the orange rows you'll see here we have a non-treated control where it didn't receive any tr seed treatment or in furrow treatment and as you can see the yield is pretty low for these guys as well as the root density. Um, but then once you add those inferro treatments, especially of um, abound or especially vellum total, you get a really good increase in root density as well as yield. When you couple that with a seed treatment of either Rancona or Dynasty, you see a huge increase in the root density and your pod yield for both uh, Rancona and vellum total or Rancona and abound as well as the Dynasty in those two products. So moving on uh, from seed quality issues and seed selection um, down to cultivar selection. So all of our peanut cultivars have different disease resistant tolerance packages, but pretty much all of them have good resistance to tomato spotted wilt. 
Um, they vary in their tolerance to root knot nematodes. There's a few varieties that do really well under high pressure situations, um, as well as there's some variation in their tolerance to especially leaf spot, white mold, and uh, rust. So in terms of cultivar selection, it's probably the most important for tomato spotted will. Um, as you can see here, this is one of our trials that we do in headland uh, from every year from 2014 to 2019. I didn't include the 2020 data as incidence was very, very low in these trials and we didn't really get good differences. Um, just because tomato spotted wilt just didn't really cause much of an issue this year for us. But you can see overall, um, Georgia 12Y um, performed very consistently from year to year. Um, and kind of followed by Georgia 09B and Georgia 06G. Tough Runner can fail in some of those high um, disease pressure years like 2016 and 2019, um, but overall Georgia 12Y performed pretty consistently. Uh, these are just some more cultivar uh, trials um, from one of our irrigated variety trials. Um, as you can see, there's about five that I have highlighted here in green that did very well for tomato spotted wilt incidents, and that includes Georgia 12Y, again, Georgia 14N, uh, Georgia Green, TIF Guard, and TIF NV. Uh, the ones with the orange stars next to it actually have very good resistant packages uh, to root knot nematodes. So if you're under a high pressure situation, um, you can avoid having to spray costly nematicides if you use one of these varieties. Um, they not only protect your fields for the current yield um, year in terms of yield, but also help reduce populations for future years. So just kind of a quick summary of some of the other cultivars and how they do against uh, white mold and leaf spot. Um, the four listed up top, Georgia 12Y, 14N, the TIF NV, and uh, the Auburn variety AU17, all do pretty well against leaf spot and white mold. Um, these top three have pretty good root knot nematode resistance as well as tomato spotted wilt tolerance, as I mentioned. Uh, the Tough Runner 511 uh, has moderate uh, tomato spotted wilt tolerance, as we saw it could fail in some of those higher yield years. Um, and then also, it has good tolerance to white mold, but it's very susceptible to leaf spot, as are Georgia 16HO and 18RU. So if you use one of these varieties, you really want to have a good fungicide spray program to kind of keep uh, leaf spot severity down. So in terms of planting dates, uh, basically, um, this isn't reinventing the wheel here. Again, um, early planting we know reduces leaf spot and rust severity. Uh, delayed planting can reduce white mold and tomato spotted wilt. Uh, the delayed planting really helps with white mold because you get a little bit warmer soil temperatures towards um, when you plant a little bit later and that can kind of help reduce white mold incidence. Um, of course, that uh, reduced strip tillage and twin row planting can help suppress tomato spotted wilt. With the twin row planting, um, we really recommend that because it can increase your ground cover faster, which kind of helps reduce thrips populations. So in, in accordance with uh, twin row planting and other um, things like cultivar selection, for tomato spotted wilt, since it is vectored by uh, several species of thrips that are present here in Alabama, we do recommend doing some insecticide treatments in furrow. We've gotten really good results with Thymet um, and imidacloprid. Uh, Thymet does provide similar thrips control as imidacloprid, but it also provides some suppression of tomato spotted wilt, and we've seen it actually reduce uh, leaf spot disease severity. We're not exactly sure of the mechanism here on why Thymet can kind of help with a leaf spot, but it's just something that we've consistently observed across the southeast. Uh, but imidacloprid is still a really good option. Um, it seems to do pretty good control against thrips. On rare occasions, we have gotten reports that it does result in a tomato spotted wilt increase. We're not exactly sure why that is, um, but it's just something to keep in mind when selecting uh, your inferno insecticides. So just moving on from insecticides to fungicides, uh, this slide is basically just to show you have a lot of different options for your fungicide selections, whether you're looking for leaf spot control, white mold, or even uh, solidocranium black rot. But overall, there's several fungicides. Um, pretty much all of them will do a really good job for leaf spot control, like Approach Prima, Lucento, Provo Silver, Provisol. Um, Umbra will give you leaf spot control, but you really have to tank mix that with chlorothalonil. 
Um, Excalia, we've also gotten some good research results as a little bit newer of a product. In terms of white mold, it doesn't have the best white mold control, but when you incorporate that into a standard fungicide spray program and um, tank mix it with another white mold control product, you can get some pretty good results with Excalia for white mold. Um, in terms of cylindrocrate and black rot, you know, if you're really worried about that, especially in the southwest part of Alabama, um, like Baldwin, Escambia counties, um, Provo Silver and Provo Sol can, or Provo Silver and Lucento can do pretty well against uh, cylindrocrate and black rot in terms of suppression. So one thing I like to highlight each year is our Peanut RX Guide. So this RX Guide, as I mentioned last year, um, is put together by, um, well, it's led by UGA, but myself, Austin Hagen, um, as well as others, Chris Balcom, contribute to this, and researchers from Florida, uh, Clemson, uh, Mississippi. We all meet once a year and talk about all our field trials, and then we'll assign um, risk points to different varieties as well as talk about um, fungicide spray programs. What we did a little bit differently this year, we have a new user interf interface where you can actually select you know, what cultivar you're using, um, your planting date, your tillage, um, what kind of herbicide program you're running, and how long you've been rotated out of peanuts, and that will kind of assess your risk um, depending on your planting date. Um, and so you'll get some Green dates will be lower risk, and then red, of course, is the highest risk, and yellow is kind of in between. But I really recommend you guys check that out. Um, and let me know what you think of the, the new user, um, user interface. So one of the things that I just wanted to touch on before moving away from fungicides is the status of chlorothalonil. Um, so this is one of the most commonly used fungicides in terms of agriculture. It's not used only in peanuts, but also in other production systems. Uh, one of the things we're concerned about and keeping an eye on is that the European Union has banned chlorothalonil due to concerns over potential health risks and impacts to wildlife, especially aquatic organisms. So they actually implemented a stop sale date of chlorothalonil in the European Union in November 2019 and a stop use date by May 20th, 2020 of this past year. We're still unsure what that means exactly for U.S. agriculture. Um, we've reached out to our industry partners and we haven't really gotten much information on it yet. Um, but it's something that we're trying to keep an eye on in case it affects um, peanut exports to um, countries that are part of the European Union. So one of the things that uh, Dr. Hagen and I wanted to look at this year was uh, chlorothalonil alternatives. So one of the things that we did, I know that this is a huge um, data slide, but basically this is just a summary of all the different products that we looked at in a standard 14-day um, spray program. So you have seven applications. And the biggest change we wanted to look at was substituting elast, which is a dotine material, for where you would normally see uh, chlorothalonil. Um, so you'll see a last in combination with products like Provo Silver, Fontellus, um, Muscle, as well as a sulfur product we have been looking at. Um, we're also looking at sulfur in combination with a latest. Um, copper sulfate is also in there. But we basically want to stay ahead of any issues that might happen due to chlorothalonil ban um, in the European Union. So this is just the first year of this data set, but overall we got really good results um, in terms of leaf spot control with all of our products and all of our treatments. Um, they all provided pretty similar control to the chlorothalonil control down here at the bottom. Uh, and they all significantly reduced uh, leaf spot dis disease severity compared to the non-treated control. So very low um, leaf spot here. We also found quite a few of them did very well against rust and white mold as well. And we also got some pretty good yield responses um, with these treatments where they significantly increased yield when compared to the non-treated control and provided very similar yields as to the chlorothalonil control. Some of them even numerically increased it like the elast, um, so the dodine, sulfur, and top guard rotation. So what we plan to do is repeat this for 2021, um, and I'll show you guys the data, hopefully in person, next year. So just to finish up here, I'll talk quickly about nematodes. Um, I've already mentioned cultivar selection, 
but just in general, for those of you who do have issues with root knot nematode and some of the other nematodes, basic, basically moisture drives nematode as well as disease pressure. Um, you know, they first appear in localized areas or hot spots in the field. Um, they spread then to the whole field via tillage equipment. And once established, you basically have them. In terms of cultivar selection and crop rotation, again, rotating out of peanuts into cotton does very well at reducing uh, root knot nematode populations. And also into corn can help, even though they can go to corn, um, corn does provide a good rotation partner. Um, and then, of course, these three varieties that I mentioned earlier, TIF Guard, Georgia 14N, and the TIF MV are all highly resistant to root knot nematode. And so if you have high disease pressure situations, we really recommend planting a resistant variety. Um, so that way you don't really have to rely on nematicides. Um, nematicides are very costly, um, so you really don't want to apply them unless you absolutely need to. Um, you can use uh, susceptible cultivars in a low to medium risk situation and apply a nematicide, and you can get um, pretty good yields out of that susceptible uh, cultivar. Um, but basically, the drive home message to this is don't guess, to so, you know, soil test. If you don't have nematodes, you won't get a yield gain by spraying those nematicides. So only apply those nematicides when and where you need them. And we've all had pretty good success with Bellum Total, AgLogic, and the Vidate. So just a, just a quick summary slide on how root knot nematode production has impacted by peanut and cultivar and nematicides. So you can see here up on the top, when we use a variety such as a Georgia 14N or TIP NV, we get a pretty good increase um, in yield. And we also get a huge decrease or reduction in the total counts of root knot nematodes. Um, and Georgia 06G is highly susceptible uh, to root knot nematodes, so that's our good control check for this. Um, so using those good resistant varieties, if you have an area that has high nematode pressure, really consider using a resistant variety. In terms of uh, nematicides, we have our non-treated control here. Um, and as you can see, vellum and AgLogic do provide a little bit of yield protection, especially that vellum total. AgLogic um, not as, doesn't do as well, um, at least in this trial. But you can see the counts aren't very much affected when you're using a variety like Georgia 06G, but you can still get pretty good yields out of it. So with that, if you have any questions, um, please don't hesitate to contact me. I have my uh, email up here, which is ashear at auburn.edu, as well as my office and cell phone numbers. Um, once COVID restrictions relax, I'm in the Alpha building with a plant diagnostic clinic. Um, just some useful links for you guys. Uh, we do have um, the updated peanut IPM guide available for you on the ACES website. And I highly recommend checking out the um, updated peanut RX.